Good morning and welcome to another episode of Better Business, Better Life. I'm your host, Deborah Chantry-Taylor, and I'm passionate about helping entrepreneurs lead their ideal lives by creating better businesses. I'm a certified EOS implementer, an FBA accredited family business advisor, and a business owner myself with several business interests. I work with established business owners and their leadership teams to help them live their ideal entrepreneurial life using EOS, the Entrepreneurial Operating System. And the guests that I have come to my show, they're here to share authentically both the highs and the lows of creating a successful business and how they turn things around in their business, either using EOS tools and traction or just sharing the stories of the things that they've actually encountered. be crazy to a startup with money thinking, oh, I want to be a unicorn, I want to be a billionaire, you know, and I want to build rockets to Mars like all the rest of them. No, that's not a good reason. Like be passionate, try and do something that you believe in, know your purpose. I, I, that's really, really important, particularly if you want to sustain it. And also, of course, it gets to a point, and this, I think it's the hardest thing, right? And we were at that point quite a few times. Okay, what do we do? Do we keep going or do we stop here? And I always remember that image of the guy digging for gold and he's going through the dirt and he's like an inch away and then he stops. I always thought, oh, that's us, you know, but just, no, we've got to keep going a bit more, a bit more. And look, in hindsight, anyone can say, oh, I should have this, I should have that. Today is actually pretty exciting because I've actually got a guy who's very, very similar to myself. We've just been having a chat before, and he is really passionate about actually helping people learn from their failures. So our guest today is the founder of YesVR, and I've been told it's okay. So it's a startup failure that may yet rise from the ashes. <laughs> he is really passionate about people doing good things, and he is also a podcast um, host himself. So he's going to share with us today about how telling stories can really help and how we can learn from failure. Paul King is the podcast host of Fail Wisdom, a podcast about failure and what we can learn from them. Welcome to the show, Paul. Thank you. It's great to be on, Deborah, and i um, looking forward to having a chat with you. Yeah, no, we had a quick chat before, as we always do, and I think the great thing is we share similar kind of passions. I don't believe failure is a is a bad word. Yeah, the F word, it's, it's not a bad thing. As long as we learn from those mistakes, then it's always a good thing, in my opinion. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And, and I'm sort of on a mission to even change the way people think about that. You know, like, if you think about it, if we don't fail, then we won't do anything. <laughs> just sit on your couch. You'll never fail. Just don't do anything and you won't fail, right? But if you want to learn and get ahead, then you'll fail and you learn from that. And there's nothing wrong with failure. It's just part of life. It's, it's actually a good thing. And, and that's why... Just like yourself, like, you know, a lot of people are sick of all the success stories, um, you know, like you were saying before, yeah, you know, it's on the beach four hours a day and, you know, they're a you know, billion dollar business or whatever. But the reality is in the startup world, particularly that's where I'm, you know, I'm coming from, I think it's like one in 20 actually succeed, but then, you know, what is success anyway? Cause a lot of startups will then go into another one and another one, but startup, look, business is hard enough. But startups where you're trying to sell something that is like a future thing that nobody knows yet is even harder. Like you're, you're selling a future vision. So that is even harder as me and my co-founder found out <laughs> over the year. Yeah. So six years with the SVR. Tell me a little bit about that. So tell me how the idea, where the idea come from? What what was the journey that you went on with that Yeah, yeah. company? It's a pretty amazing journey. Oh, look, my, my background and my co-founder. We're both in the in education. We're both educators, and we were training people in the online space. So we actually worked for the largest training organisation in the Southern Hemisphere for many years. And what we found is students were pretty bored, not very much, not very engaged, and really low completion rate actually. And so I was at a convention in 2016, and. Uh, I went outside and there's all these demo desks and this guy's like, Hey, you want to try this VR? And I'm thinking, Oh, this VR stuff could be interesting. You know, like see things in 3D, you know, what this all about. So uh, I put on the headset and I'm like, Oh my God, uh, this is crazy. I, I, I'm going to die. Look, I'm by fall. Like what's going on? So I took it off again. It's like, yeah, did you enjoy the helicopter, helicopter ride over Sydney? 
<laughs> it was like, wow, it just blew me away because it actually felt like I was there. So I found that really exciting. And then over like a few months, I was thinking, imagine if you could actually place students in the actual workplace that they're going to go into and they experience that and they make decisions and they see the consequences firsthand, but in a safe space. And so they get to experience that. So I started filming uh, 360 VR because I've got a background in filming something like I'm always a self-taught guy. I might have degrees and diplomas, but all the areas I end up getting into are the areas that I teach myself. So it's funny, but yeah, so we started filming some stuff, putting scenarios together. And then we found that, you know, for what we wanted, there was no technology at that time, it was 2017, that we could put the scenarios together that, that we wanted. And so then uh, we got in contact because like I've done a little bit of programming, but I am a right brain person, very creative. You know, I'll, I'll be struggling with programming, like take me like half a day to work out something where some 18 year old go, well, that's it. Okay. I'm like, okay, forget about programming. Anyway, so we started down the development track. We got in touch because that time, you know, the funds were, were low. We got in touch with a developer actually in, in Ukraine. That was Dima, lovely guy. He said, yes, I can build this platform for you. It will take six weeks and then three hours per scenario after that. So fantastic. Four years later, five years later, at seven hundred thousand dollars down the track. You know, it just if you don't know development, and even if you do, you know, double it, quadruple it, quadruple how much it's going to cost, and ten times that for the time it's going to take. A lot of lessons still to be learned there. For example, you know, just don't develop that much and put money somewhere else, and we can talk about that. But. Yeah, we, we developed the platform and we actually won lots of awards. Well, it's called the LearnX Design. So anyone in the learning design space, that is like, that's the top awards. And we won heaps because my co-founder, Diane, was a brilliant educator and she put some amazing learning design and we, we did amazing, like we got the actors to do these amazing, amazing performances and put it together in a way that was really creative for the time. And then we got an intern who became a sales guy, a lovely guy from Chile, and he started getting it out there and starting to sell. And then we, we had a few training organizations that were going to go ahead with us. And that was late 2019. So you know what happens after that, right? COVID, everything stopped two years. And yeah, then we thought, oh, maybe we shouldn't be in the hospital this place. Let's look at aged care. Let's look at this. No, aged care, they don't want to pay any money either. Just like hospitality people and yeah and and so after covid then we actually came really really close to some big big deals i could tell you that story later about one with one of the, uh, the head and owner of uh one of the ma the major supermarkets here um has a chain of hotels because we're in the hospitality space because that's where my co-founder was in so that was the training like Responsible service, alcohol, customer service, and all that. And so the head of that organization was really keen on our training. He tried it out and he flew down from Queensland to the incubator at Macquarie Uni that we're situated in. But, you know, I can tell you the story about that a bit later. And then COVID came along. And uh, yeah, and, and so after COVID, we came, we just lacked in the sales area. So Diane, my co-founder, he hated sales. I wasn't keen either. And being a, a person that was adopted, rejection is a big issue. So it's not fun constantly getting rejected. But B2B sales is, you know, like I learned a lot that it is a long-term thing, you know, three months to maybe 18 months for a sale. And then we got so close and then pulled out. And then I think it was like a year ago, we had an investor that was in, massive in the hospitality space. We were going to take us, you know, all around the world. Um, he was going to put in a lot of money for like 20% of the business. And then that all was going through. And then the last minute boop, pulled out. And so after six years and being so close and then this happening, my co-founder, she just like, no, nah, I've had enough. And she just left for three months, pretty much, pretty much left. And then I was struggling for three months and I just 
thought, oh, I can't do this anymore. And then I just, I just um, pulled out as well. And I spent two weeks because, you know, obviously you're, you're upset about it. You put six years of your life, a lot of money. None of us were paid ever, you know. And uh, I spent two weeks watching the series Breaking Bad on my phone, on the TV. That's all I did for two weeks because it totally engaged me. It sounds crazy, but that's what helped me to, to get over that, you know. And then after that, you know, I, I thought, oh, what am I going to do? You know what? I want to do something I really love because I love the whole filming side and working with actors. I've done courses on directing. I, I loved all that side. That was 1% because we didn't have the money to do too much of it. However, having said that, the first scenarios we did, we actually did that on a shoestring budget practically for nothing, which was pretty amazing. And I can tell you that story too, if you want, but so many stories. Yeah. And, and so I, I started the podcast cause I think, well, I'm just going to do something I really love. I love helping people. I had a community radio show. I love that. I'm going to help early stage startup founders where I was so they can learn lessons from others about failures, not talking about successes, about I mean, interview successful people, but I want to know about your failure. And so people can learn from those stories. So I wish I had my podcast <laughs> when I started in those first few years. So yeah, that, that's my story about Yes We Are. Bit long-winded. No, that's great. So I'm going to take you back a little bit because you said that, you know, you obviously any kind of IT or development project, yes, you can basically take whatever they say, multiply it by three or four times and 10 times the amount of time. That's pretty standard, I think, for those things. But you said that you didn't really understand what was going to be required in terms of sales. And I remember when I used to do market validation at the Ice House with, with startup businesses, I would say to them, no matter what you spend on development, you should actually allow the same amount of money to invest in sales and marketing because you think you're going to build it and they're just going to come and that's it. But that's not the way that it works. You have to put a lot of effort in. And like you said, long sales cycles, you're trying to convince people to use something they've maybe never used before. So for those listening out there who's like, but the idea is so great, everybody's going to come and use it. What would you say to them? <laughs> I'd say absolutely. Instead of just doing a whole massive amount of development, just do your MVP, really basic. And then with that, go and spend most of your money on sales and marketing. That was the mistake that we did. And I, I'll tell you why, because we had some other companies that were just doing pretty much the same thing as us that came along later. It's a bit about timing as well, because it was early days. And then they got investment. I, I, I mean, I'm, I'm friends with one of the CEOs and he's like, got a team of 10 business development people. And they're now all around the world. And they're pretty much doing what we're doing. And they did that in two years. So in six years, yeah, you know, because in the end, like our runway, you know, it was running out and we had developers and we thought, no, we can't get rid of the developers because, you know, we still need to develop this and that and make it better. No, mistake, mistake. And, and holding on to employees as well, like, you know, it was like a sort of a family in a way. And then the, oh, you know, will they get another job? Unfortunately, business is a bit brutal. We have a lovely business culture, but. You just got to let people go early if things aren't going well, put the money into sales and marketing. I mean, we, we also had some bad experience. We had a sales guy after COVID, he came in, it was like top guy recommended. And cause we didn't know much about it. It's like, yeah, yeah. Like I'm on it and I'm talking to the head of this organization and that organization. Oh yeah, we're really close. Then after I think four or five months, like things like can't be right. Like. Can you just give us like all your contacts? He said, yeah, he was always saying, no, I do everything by hand and he'd show a sheet of paper. And so what we got after five months was a list of 135 people, most of them saying, make contact or something and uh, in negotiation. And I rang, uh, 10 of them and I said, who is, I'll just call him John, John, no, I haven't heard of him. So yeah, you gotta be careful too. <laughs> like. We're pretty gullible, I think. We just, that was our luck with, with sales. So we thought, oh, what are we, no, okay, I just, I met a lot of people say, just do it yourself. And I think if you can do it yourself, and I did do some good sales courses, but, and I came really close. I just couldn't close some of those big deals. And some people will lead you on as well, say, yeah, you yeah, know, we, we want to go ahead. We want to go ahead. And then you'll send another email and you contact, yeah, yeah, no, we're just busy this week. This went on for months sometimes. And it's just like, I think, at some stage, you've got to send something saying, uh, look, you know, 
either you you want to go ahead with this like in a nice way or you know I'm, well, i've got to move on and, and maybe they'll respond i don't know that but you're sort of desperate in a way because all the money is running out and you really need to sell you know what you've got is great and yeah and, and that's the worst thing as well if you're desperate you're doing sales people pick that up yeah you can't afford to be yeah absolutely i completely agree i think it's the, the worst place to be in and you got to actually have you got, what, do they, what do they say you shouldn't actually be wed to the outcome at all you should be there to to offer your help and don't be wed to the outcome if they if they just say no that so be it but I think what's really interesting, so a lot of the, the people listening to this podcast tend to have more established businesses, but the same principles apply when you're looking at introducing a new product or a new service into your business as well. We tend to get carried away by the next big, great, you know, great big idea and it's all going to be amazing, but it actually requires some validation. It requires you know, a, a huge investment in terms of people going out there. In terms of your, your salesperson, I wonder if there is something around what you are measuring with them. We'll call him John. So, you know, whether, whether or not the, the stuff that you are holding him accountable for from a scorecard basics measurables, you know, was, I wonder if you could have picked it up any earlier. Yeah. Look now, if, if, if I was to do it again and talk to other salespeople said, if, if it's not written down in HubSpot or whatever, then it didn't happen. So that we would have like daily updates, everything to be put down in your CRM and you know, and, and daily, weekly updates and, and really monitor them well. And, you know, not just like, oh yeah, I'm really close. Yeah. I've got this big one, this big fish and blah, blah, blah. Just going on people's words. That, that was really ignorant of us, you know, to, and, and also the stories, his mother died, his sister got paralyzed and in the end we're thinking it's possible. Like, you know, we felt sorry for him as well. And, you know, I think it was just. I actually think he had some sort of vice and he was just getting some extra money and yeah, you know, uh, look, you learn from it, you know? You do. I think it's, it's interesting that you said, said that, you know, if you can do sales yourself, you should do. I think it's really hard to have a business where you're the only person that can actually sell. So I do believe that you do need help in terms of getting extra salespeople in there. What would you do differently in terms of employing a salesperson now? So what are the lessons that you've learned from John? <laughs> Well, uh, what I'd do differently, I would, you know, I, like I went through a sales group before and they recommended him. This time I would interview them myself. I mean, we did an interview, but I would interview them myself and see their sales record, try and get somebody also in the same area with connection. Let's say we're in hospitality. So someone with a hospitality background that has connections to those area, I think is really important. And as I said, you know, everything has to be written down, everything monitored and, and make sure if, if, if nothing's happening within like even a month or two months and, and there's no proof for, or, you know, then just, you know. Yeah. Was it, they say a uh, higher, slowly fa um, fire fast. <laughs> yeah. 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 That's, um, I think Gary V talks about that. Well, I think he's higher, fast, fire fast. <laughs> All right. Okay. <laughs> I, I, rec I reckon hire slowly, fire fast. Cause I've been mean, making sure you've got people who share the right core values and that actually will fit in with your own organization and can prove their things. Interesting what you were saying about the clients. You know, I, I, I don't know what it's like where you are, but certainly in, in New Zealand, you know, I think there's this whole thing about not wanting to say no. So it's almost like we want to appease people. And so we will keep saying, yes, we don't want to actually just say no. I'm British. We're a little bit like that. But at the end of the day, we're also kind of prepared to go, you know what? I'm just not interested. Leave me alone. It's interesting when you're in B2B sales, people do tend to kind of, you know, drag it out and try really hard. I don't know if they're trying not to say no, or if they're thinking they'll make you feel good, but tell me a bit about more about that experience for you. So you had people who were saying, yeah, yeah, we're interested, but we've just got this on, or we've just got that on. Tell me how that worked. There was one group, the hospitality group. And they were interested, but it was through another contact of ours in Melbourne. So we, we had like these amazing contacts and these guys would, they, they knew a lot of people in the space. And but, so they would show them what we have on the headset. And so I was in Melbourne, just pre COVID as well with this group, talking to the general manager or the CEO and someone else. And they were quite interested, but they were saying, oh, but. If only we had, you know, not just RSA, but also I think they wanted something on, um, money laundering or something like that. And that's another lesson as well. Like you, you can't just 
you know, cater to everybody. You've got to start with what you have. And I should have said, well, yeah, that could be something we'll do later. Let's get started with this. But, and they, they, they weren't quite convinced. And then after COVID, this contact got in touch with them again and said, yeah, no, we're interested. We want to go ahead. And we offered them a really good deal. And every week he said, no, I'm just a bit busy at the moment, um, but I'm still interested. Just went on for months and months in the end. I just, you know, and, and there was another training organization as well. And they were really interested to do something with us. And what they wanted to do as well is to do some sort of profit sharing, right? And then um, they were really keen to go ahead. And then that just through another contact as well. And then they just went quite as well and, and nothing happened. And the funny thing is, um, as you say, like, you know, we could be resurrected. That same training group now has done a trial with us and they're looking at, um, maybe signing a contract where we will profit share with them and they'll introduce it to other groups. And we've also had, you know, that we're not doing any sales, we've had two other groups approach us as well. And I have to say as well, like say a month or two after everything went to, to pieces, I get a phone call because I get a lot of phone calls like, you know, we're an IT group and we can help you out. I just thought it was one of those said, oh, hi. So look, before you go any further, yes, VR is no longer. I said, oh, and I said, oh, just, just by the way, um, who, who are you? I said, oh, I'm blah, Sarah from a major hospitality group. <laughs> and we looked at your website and I'm like, hmm. well, actually we've stopped, but you could buy us if you want. But I never heard back from her. So you always ask who it is first before you, you know, say, oh, you're, no, we're finished because but anyway, so the funny thing is like these people are coming out of the woodwork, but I think it's a bit to do with timing as well, because when we started, like I could tell you a story about this first demo we did, oh, it was an absolute disaster with, you know, what we had to have them with phones and stuff. And it was such early days. People just didn't know what VR was as compared to now, nearly everyone does. And most people have tried it as well. So timing is really important. Like we were really the first in Australia doing this and that's not necessarily a good thing, you know? There's, there's some, again, some say, I can't remember who said it, but it's actually, you're best to be second in the market. The first one actually wears all the hits, wears all the costs, has to do the education. And I'm sure, I don't know if you've read this, but Jeffrey Moore is crossing the chasm. It's a really great book that talks about the fact a lot of businesses, you know, we talk about the classic S curve or hockey stick curve. That doesn't happen very often. And way before that, there's actually like a chasm, which is like, if you can't get more than just the early adopters taking on board your technology, you literally drop into the chasm and you die, you never get out of it. And so it's like, how do you actually go from having the early adopters to actually having the, the sort of the majority of people who are actually prepared to, to start using this product? And I think that the first people to market often don't, you know, they, they're fighting all of that. They'll get the first people who are really excited because they're the early adopters, but they haven't managed to actually get the majority of people actually interested. Yeah, no, I totally agree with that. And that's what happened to us. And interestingly enough, there's a company in the US called Striver, S-T-R-I-V-R. They're pretty much doing what we're doing. But in 2016, they were at an American football match and they were using some VR for that. And one of the executives of Walmart tried it out and he said, oh, this is amazing. You know, let's, let's talk about it. And now Striver are training 1.5 million Walmart employees and the Verisign employees, and they're absolutely gone massive and they're pretty much doing the same thing as us. But then again, America is usually ahead, you know, like sometimes three or four years. And also I think they're more open to things as well. They've, they've also got a bigger market. I mean, this is what we do. We don't understand when I have my American guests come on the podcast, they'll talk about small business. And I have to say to them, be very careful because a small business in New Zealand or Australia is, you know, something under a hundred employees. Your small business can be a thousand employees and a large business is tens of thousands of employees. The scale is just so, so different. And so even getting a very tiny slice of the pie in America can mean huge amounts of, of income for the business. Yeah, that, that's absolutely true. And even like American investors, they're, they're more open to investing. There, there was a bit of a bugbearer's mind as well. I don't know if we can talk about that, but we bootstrapped, right? Because we thought like with investment, they usually want to see you producing sales, right? And we think, well, if we get sales, then why do we need investment? 
And so we bootstrapped and looking back now in hindsight, I probably should have gone after investment, but the thought of one of our mentors, very successful, three startups, very successful, he said, if you're going to go down the investment path, you'll be doing that full time for a year. And I thought, I don't even want to do it. <laughs> I don't really like going after investors. But now, if I was to do a startup again, depending on the timing, I still think if you can bootstrap, I mean, there's people like Canva, uh, Atlassian, they're huge, and they are bootstrapped actually, which is amazing. And it's great if you can be in control of your own company, of course. But sometimes, uh, you know, like looking back, if we could have got investment, say, in 2021, and then pull all that into marketing and sales mainly, then I, I think we'd be in a completely different space right now. Yeah. It is interesting. Though, when I was doing my work at the ISAS, a lot of the American investors, they, are, they only want to invest in their own backyard. There's not an awful lot of American investors who come over and invest in Kiwi technology or Australian technology. They tend to be very much about, they want to have something that's close to where they live, that they can kind of be involved in. So it's hard. I don't know what, what's the investment scene like in Australia these days? Um, well, uh, I mean, I've, I've interviewed some VCs, I've interviewed some people from Lend for Good as well. So there's different spaces. So you've got like the mums and dads sort of investors, you know, when someone starts off, it gets them going. And then you might have the angel investors, like here there's Sydney Angels and that sort of thing. You might get up to like a million dollars. And then there's the VCs, of course, they're all looking for the unicorns, you know, like the 1 billion above. And so they, okay, they might invest in say 20 or 40 and one gets to a billion and they get a hundred X their, their investment. But the problem is, you know, what about everybody in between? And particularly, and I think you said at the start, I'm particularly interested and passionate about the social enterprise impact space, people doing something for good. And it's really hard to get investment in that space, but there are companies like Lend for good and, and others, but there's a huge gap. In, in Australia, there's a $31 billion gap of it between, somewhere between the mums and dads, angels, and, and the VCs in that space. And so, yeah, it, it, it's very hard for people in that space. And even for anyone, because if they're looking for the unicorn, you know, you have to have something that can scale dramatically worldwide. I mean, some people would say that's what a startup is. You know, there's all different definitions. To be honest, like when I started, I didn't even know what a startup was. People say startup. They say, oh, what's that? <laughs> oh, I'm a startup. Okay. I think it's interesting. I think the term entrepreneur gets into change with startup. And I, I, the, my view of an entrepreneur is something very, very different to a startup. But you're right. When it comes to investment, most people who are looking to invest, they're looking to get big returns. And the only thing that can genuinely scale to that kind of level is usually a tech startup. So there's a lot of really for good businesses out there that are doing amazing things, but they're not going to be um, the scalable, sustainable return type business that those investors are actually looking for. So it's challenging because they're, they're the ones that will actually make the biggest difference, but they won't make the biggest dollars. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And it just depends. Like there are some investors that will, you know, invest because they want to make a difference, but unfortunately they're few and far between. Okay, so a couple of things that we've kind of learned on the journey so far. So first of all, MVP, don't go out and make all the bells and whistles. Start with something small, test it with your market, make sure there's a real need for it. I guess don't necessarily believe what people say, as in they'll tell you that they want it and they'll tell you that it's great, but there's a difference between telling you you want something than actually opening up your wallet and handing over cold, hard cash to purchase that thing. Getting the right people around you is pretty important and being able to measure them on their effectiveness so that you can really see if they are uh, moving the needle as, as I call it in the business and sometimes knowing timing timing was really important right so being being at the right time perhaps not being the first to market any other lessons that really stand out for you well yeah the whole in, yeah get investment if you need it like you don't have to you shouldn't necessarily bootstrap if you can it's great if it works for you I'd say don't fall in love with your employees, so to speak. And you know, if you're feeling sorry, like, you know, if they have to move on, they'll get something else. Um, you have to look after your business first. And yeah, also, obviously, you know, you've got to maintain your mental health as well. It's like startup world is brutal and there's so many ups and downs, you know, it's a, it's a roller coaster. So you need to maintain your mental health. And I've interviewed many people on my podcast that have 
burnt out. Some of them actually in large corporations, and then they started to start up, some in the startup themselves. In fact, I was interviewing a doctor just last week, and she pretty much got burnt out herself, and she's a doctor. So you've got to maintain that. Actually, I, I was in a, a talk about a year ago to a whole bunch of young startup hopefuls by these you know, startup founders and mentors. And I was saying, if you want to make it in the startup world, you've got to work 18 hours a day, seven days a week. I thought, you, you I, I'm not going to swear on your podcast, but you idiots or, yeah, I mean, seriously, like, how are you going to tell these young guys that? Like, they would burn out in like six months, one year. It's going to be useless. Like, yeah, be passionate, but you've got to maintain your health and your mental health, you know, and, and you're not going to do it like that. That's. You can only do that for so long and then... I was going to say, you can do that in short sprints, I think. I think it's, you know, sometimes there are times when the business absolutely needs it. If you're doing that consistently, whether that be a startup or an established business, let's be realistic, it's just not sustainable. And, and, and you've got to think always, well, why are you doing this, you know? So it's really important as well. You have to believe in what you're doing, not do it for the money, so to speak. Like, you'd be crazy to a startup with money, thinking, oh, I want to be a unicorn, I want to be a billionaire... You know, and I want to build rockets to Mars, like all the, all the rest of them. No, that's not a good reason. Like be passionate, try and do something that you believe in, know your purpose. I, I, that's really, really important, particularly if you want to sustain it. And also, of course, it gets to a point, and this, I think it's the hardest thing, right? And we were at that point quite a few times. Okay, what do we do? Do we keep going or do we stop here? And I always remember that image of you know the guy digging for gold and he's going through the dirt and he's like an inch away and then he stops i always thought oh that's us you know but just no we've got to keep going a bit more a bit more and but look in hindsight anyone can say yeah oh, i should have this i should have that but if really if if really not going well then sometimes you think oh but i've wasted all this time and all this money well yeah sometimes you just got to think well maybe it's best to pack it in now before you double up on all of that and it doesn't work, I guess. But it, it's re it's a really hard call, I guess. I think you, in that case, and I've, I've had that myself as well, so I've had a couple of business failures, as you know, and, and the thing for me was that I actually had to have external people around me who could help me to make that decision because you become so passionate about what you're doing, what you're trying to do. You also, as you said, have put all this money, time, effort, your life into this thing. And you just really want it to work. But I, I think with me, I had to actually get some external people in to, to give me some objectivity and just sort of, you know, know when it was time to actually call it quits. And I always like to reposition and kind of go, you know, yep, sure, it failed, but it was just another expensive MBA. You know, it was a, it was a great learning opportunity. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I interviewed one of the founders of Twitter. His nickname's Rabble, really interesting guy. And um, he was saying, look, most, most, Founders and that, they'll go through like seven different startups before they become successful. The funny thing is, well, talking about MVPs as well, that these guys were actually developing uh, a podcast, like the first one, right? And then, you know, there was some issues and then they said, look, let's do a hackathon, at, which they did over a week or something. And then they came up with 12 different ideas, right? So they said, okay, let's go with these three. And one of those was Twitter, okay? And so he says, when people say to me, Twitter looks like it was made in a day, he said, yeah, it was, it was made in six hours. <laughs> but then using the customer feedback constantly, they improved it, you know, over time. So that just shows you, you can, you know, Twitter, they made it in six hours and then they just improved it over time. So, you know, look, it depends what space you're in and it's not that complex, but it just goes to show you. And. And he also says it's all about who you know as well. So, you know, it, it's your network and your contact. The most important thing is your network and contacts, particularly in the startup world. And then, you know, you can go from one to another and people respect you. They know who you are. And like, as, as you probably know, Deborah, as well, even in the sales space, and, you know, it, it's what you build up over time, you know, your, your own personal you know, people that will recommend you and the people in your network and the respect they have for you. And you build that up over, over a long period of time, which does make it difficult for, for young people, you know, haven't got that big network, 
But then you just, you just need to you need to reach out and ask for help, right? And this is one of my biggest lessons that I learned many, many years ago is that it's okay to ask for help. Uh, we cannot possibly know everything and we need to actually do it. And, you know, people actually enjoy helping you. So when you ask for help, you're actually making that person feel good about being able to help you. So don't feel afraid to go, I don't know it all. I'd love to have some help. No, it's a, it's a really good point. In fact, most people that are a bit miserable and not happy are ones that are always focused on themselves. That's why, you know, it's like for me, uh, as we discussed before, it's all about the journey. Okay. So like, okay, we'll get to this goal. I want to be this unicorn. Okay. I'm now on this unicorn. Am I happy? Am I satisfied? Is my life? No. In fact, I interviewed somebody that's really into that space, knows all these people and said, most, like half of them are really miserable. Because maybe they got there and then they just don't have anyone really close to them anymore, or the way they got there, well, they, you know, that may not have been a great path. They've got money, but money's nothing. Like when you leave this place, you know, planet Earth, you don't take any of that stuff with you, but you will take all the good things that you've done, all the growth that you've had. And that's why I don't look at my time in the startup world as a failure. I look at it as an amazing time where I learned so much. I met amazing people. To be honest, like, yeah, it was brutal, but I had a, a ball as well. And, um, you know, I, I, I wouldn't, you know, if I had my chance again, I, I'd do it again. Yeah, I'm the same. I think a lot of those people, I always thought they're, they're on the hamster wheel, right? It's like, when I get to this, then it'll be better. And then when they get there, it's like, when I get to this, it'll be better. When I get to this, it'll be better. It's like, actually... You've got to really enjoy what is going on as, as, as it's going on and really take the lessons from it because, as you said, money can't be taken with you, but all those experiences of people around you absolutely can be. And I also think that it's, it, they, if you can learn from the lessons, sure, they can be quite tough, but they actually they help to build resilience. It mean, means that life will become easier as you go through it as well. So, yeah. <laughs> So you've interviewed lots of people on your podcast about, you know, failure and what failure is for them and how they got through it. They've shared their stories. Is there any common threads on there? Common threads? Yeah, like we were talking about before, people holding on for too long. In fact, this, recently I interviewed uh, this lovely girl, got a startup. She's been going for, I think, a couple of years. Big development going on. And so I don't think she's really tested it with enough people. And she said, I don't have an MVP. I have a MLP, min not minimal viable product, minimal lovable product. And I thought, and that didn't register. Then after I thought, not good. Like you're in love with your product, which is great. But up to the point where you just want to develop it and you just know, and that's, that's me, right? That, that was me as well. Like, yeah, this is going to be amazing. Everyone's going to love it. And you know, that, that's a mistake. And I actually, after the podcast, I wrote her a, a nice email saying, you know, just be careful with that. And, you know, from my experience and others and, you know, so that, that worried me a bit. So keep an, keep going when, or, or just falling in love with your, with your product. Or I'll tell you another big mistake that people make that they become their business or startup. That's them, they're like, I'm my business. They're like if I talk about SBR, yeah, I'm, I'm SBR. No, you are Paul, you're over here, you're an individual. And that's just your business. If you're a CEO, that's just your title, you know, and because if you can separate that, or if you can't, then when something happened, it's like a failed business fail. Oh my God, I failed. I'm SBR. I'm the CEO. I failed. No, that failed, but you're over here, you're continuing on, you're, you're learning, you know? So people that identify really deeply with their startup, like it, it, it's them, you know? So I think that's, that's another big mistake as well. And, and also people that don't maintain their mental health properly. And the main things with mental health that most people do that are successful with that, number one is sleep, get enough sleep, get good sleep, exercise, you know, good diet. And, and also, you know, socialize, get out there with people. Like even myself at the moment, I'm working from home, but I get out often and I see some of my ex-founder friends and visit places. I think it's really important as well. I mean, everyone's a bit different in that area, but well, one other thing as well, I would, I would say, highly recommend is being in uh, a space with other founders, even if look. 
if you can get there physically sometimes, great, more, even better. But having that connection and that communication with other startup founders, more than mentors, because you can get mentor whiplash because one mentor says this, one says that, one says the other, right? But if you're with a, in a room with a bunch of founders, there's nothing better than that to work things out because they're on the same journey as well. And I found that with a lot of people I interviewed, they think exactly the same thing. And a lot of them, like I did at the beginning, have this mentor whiplash. People really try to help you and do the right thing, but they say, no, you should do this, this, and this, and the other. This. Like, oh my God. What? Sometimes I got off calls in the early days, like, what do I do? What do I do? You know, and I just felt like my head was going to explode. Yeah, and that's one of my things I've always had. I've, I've done a lot of mentoring as well as coaching. And I think, you know, as mentors, we are there to kind of share experiences and tell you what we think you should do. But it's they're not there to coach. And I think a coach is a person who can actually help you come up to the right decision by asking the intelligent questions. A mentor is more likely to tell you from their, based on their experiences. So if you've got multiple mentors, you're right, they're pulling you in all different directions. But the peer group, the peer group, I think it's that I, all these things we're talking about are relevant for startups, but they're also relevant for business owners, even established business owners. Having a peer group where people are going through the same things as you and can share from their own experiences and having the experiences at the same time as you is in some ways far more powerful than having a mentor who's, who's done, done it before. So, yeah. Yeah. And in the startup world, like we are, the startup founders, we are a bunch of weirdos. And that, that's a quote from the Twitter, Twitter founder. We were really weird <laughs> in the way that a lot of people can't relate to us because we are we're like, a lot of us are risk takers and the stuff we're doing, you talk to other people and they're like, oh, okay, even like my wife and kids like, yeah, okay. And you talk to other founders like, yeah, we're all passionate and you can relate to each other. So you got to get it with the other weirdos. So just. Same with business, with business. I mean, businesses that be, end up becoming, you know, established businesses from startups, that there's also, it's a different breed. I mean, I, I'm married to an actuary and I'm an entrepreneur. I mean, I've, I've done many, many different businesses and I still have my fingers in many, many pies as well. I'm married to an actuary. There's no way in the world he'll ever understand what I do. Not a, I mean, because if you think about every single spectrum, you know, taking risks, he's got to have all the facts and all the figures and then he'll only take calculated risks and then it'll be very, very low risk. Whereas I'm like, sure, it'll be okay. It'll be all right. What's the worst that? What's the worst that can happen? That's always my favorite quote. What's the worst that can happen? And so far, you know, a few bad things have happened, but not, not, not the end of the world. You know, here's a bit of a story. Like I interviewed that doctor recently and she does actual end of life care, right? And she was saying that the main thing that people will say, what do you regret at the end of life? is not taking more risk and not doing things. So there you go. Yeah, there you go. We should, we should die pretty happy when we eventually get there, I guess. Hey, look, we could talk for hours, but I do try and keep these things reasonably short just so that people have a chance to listen to them all. Tell me very quickly about your, your podcast. So you obviously are interviewing people who are sharing their failures and telling you what they've learned from them. It's called Startup, Fail Wisdom, one word, podcast. I actually started with another, like I, I absolutely want to fail in, in, the, in the, the title because I'm like, now I'm going to change fail as a meaning. I'm going to make it something good. And then... I, I went to a couple of founder friends and they said, I was actually going to call it the Failed Startup Founders Podcast. So I talked to some friends, uh, like startup, they said, Paul, we're not coming on your show with that name. And so I looked at all these other names and I'm like, oh, what do I do? You know, and chat GPT and like, I end up with Startup Journeys Founders Unplugged. So if you go to my pod, you'll see the first episodes like that. And I was never happy with it. I'm never happy. And then a good friend of mine, Bernie said, Paul, actually another person I interviewed is a, is a friend of mine, actually, he's a, a Hollywood director. They call him the director's director because I did some courses with him. Beautiful man, Mark W. Travis, L listen to his podcast. It's wonderful. And he said, Paul, you should, you should keep fail there. If a word is, that's what you really wanted. And I said, yeah, you're right. So after and I was searching again and I thought fail wisdom. And I said to my wife, said, can you have two words together? She's a teacher, right? And I said, y you like English teacher? Yeah, yeah, of course you can. Conjugated word. And I said, I was hopeless that he was teaching IT, right? And, and so I thought, that's it, the start, Startup Fail Wisdom podcast. And I was just like, you know, it's like it clicked, like that's, that's it. That's what I want. So I've just actually building my website at the moment. It will be released next week. So it's failwisdom.com. But the story is that I wanted to help other founders that were like early stage founders where I was and entrepreneurs 
you know, all those years ago, didn't look, I didn't have a business background, didn't know anything. Like I'm a dummy. I still am, am a dummy, but I learned from all these people about from my failures and all the, all the, all of their failures as well. So I have highly successful people and others that, you know, like Bernie, that was like my second or third episode that his crypto thing was hacked $5 billion and completely collapsed. Like there's all sorts of stories, amazing stories, but it's all about stories because people love stories. And I think that's the best way to learn. And then, you know, we talk about failures and other things as well. So it's to help early stage founders. And I've been really passionate about the social enterprise impact space as well. So that's, that's my purpose is to help as many founders as I can to hopefully have a easier journey than I had. And that's wonderful. And look, I think a lot of the lessons that uh, we're talking about for startups are just as valid for established business owners as well. And so, you know, I, I, and I think if you look, if you look at the real, like one of my favorites is Richard Branson, right? Richard Branson had several failures before he ever became successful. He was bankrupt twice, I think. So, you know, we all go through this and one day we come out the other side and everything's rosy. But I think without all of these, the, if you want to call them failures, but these learnings, we would never get to where we get to. So I think it's important to share those stories. Absolutely. Yeah. And, you know, we're both similar in that way that. You know, we, we believe in, in that as well. So it's been great being on, on your podcast today. It's been lovely to have you. I'm looking forward to actually returning the favor and come and telling you a few of my, because I've had at least two failures so far. So I'd love to tell you a little bit about that. But um, yeah, no, thank you for your time and thank you for sharing your lessons. And hey, let's hope that this is a, a phoenix rising from the ashes. But if not, I tell you what, you'll have learned so much that there'll be another, there'll be another something that is going to be your thing. Absolutely. Lots of personal growth and, and, you know, it's just been an amazing journey and, and really looking forward to having you on the show as well, Deborah. Fantastic. Thank you for having me today. Thank you very much. Thanks, Paul. Pleasure.